This is an introduction to English grammar part three, syntax and structure. This is for a course at the University of Utah and my name is Karen. The goals for this presentation is that students will be able to identify inflectional and derivational morphemes and also students will be able to separate sentences into their dif different constituents. Language, it appears, is structured in a hierarchy and not in a line, not in a straight line. Important terms that we're going to be learning today are morphology, syntax, morphosyntax, affix, parts, parts of speech, phrase, and sentence. Okay, here's a thinking activity. Um, what is the significance of this sentence? This is a very famous sentence in the world of linguistics. Colorless green ideas sleep furiously. Okay. Um, what is unique about this sentence is that it demonstrates that a sentence can still be understandable even when it doesn't make sense. So the reason this sentence is understandable is because syntactically it's grammatical. The important vocabulary we'll talk about today are morphology, the study of word structure, syntax, the study of sentence structure, and morphosyntax, which is the study of word and sentences together. Okay. Linguists believe that language, as it's represented in our mind, has a hierarchical structure. Okay. Hierarchy is where we have a system that ranks some things above each other. In other words, some words and phrases are larger than other words and phrases. Okay. Consider this example from your textbook. The excited child chased the new puppy around the garden. How many words are there in this sentence? We can count the words. We can count the excited child chased the new puppy around the garden. That's very easy. We just go one word at a time. Okay, but when we look at this sentence, what other words might belong together to create some sort of grouping together? We call these constituents. Hint, okay, you can group the things and maybe they're a standalone as the answer to a question. Something like, who chased the new puppy around the garden? The answer would be the excited child. So it appears that the excited child is grouped together. What other groupings do we have in this sentence? And then try to list the phrases or constituents of this sentence. I'm going to give you just a second to do that and then I'll go to the next slide where I have them listed for you. Okay, here we have first a list of the words that are in the sentence. And then we have the sentence itself. The excited child chased the new puppy around the garden. And then we have this list of phrases. As we group things from the sentence together, it seems like some things go together better than others. So we have the excited child, um, and then we have one, chase the new puppy around the garden. It doesn't seem to make sense to group child chased. Those two words don't seem to go together in quite the same way that the excited child seems to go together. Okay, here you see the other constituents and how we've grouped them. When we look at the hierarchy, that some things are larger than others, you can see how I've separated out the whole sentence. The excited child chased the new puppy around the garden. Okay, here I have the excited child. And then it seems like chase the new puppy around the garden is grouped together as well. But it seems like we can break that down into some smaller parts. Chased, the new puppy, and around the garden. Linguists believe that this hierarchy can be found at all levels of language, from the structure of individual sounds, to sentence structure, to the structure of longer pieces of discourse. The process of how we convert our mental hierarchy um, into the streams of speech is still open to investigation. Many linguists are still researching how does that happen. Okay, your textbook takes a bottom-up approach to describing morphosyntax. We're going to start at the word level and then we'll work up to the sentence level. The levels covered in this course are affix plus root, word, phrase, clause, and sentence. An affix is a small piece of a word that joins to something else. They include, in languages, prefixes, suffixes, and infixes. However, English does not have any infixes. In English, we consider two kinds of affixes. We have inflectional and derivational. Okay? We also sometimes call these inflectional morphemes and derivational morphemes. 
Inflection refers to the process of adding grammatical information through an affix. In English, all inflectional morphemes are suffixes. Derivation refers to the process of creating new words through an affix. So adding something to the root of a word to create an entirely new word. Let's look at some examples. We're going to start with inflectional affixes. So in English, all accepted inflectional affixes are suffixes. In fact, you have a list of these inflectional morphemes in your book. Inflectional affixes are used to indicate grammatical information about the sentence. Let's look at an example. Here we have the sentence, I talked to my professor yesterday. Um, the ED in talked is outlined in blue um, to indicate that it's, a, it's an inflectional affix. That inflectional affix gives us grammatical information that adds to the root word talk. The ED in this case is a morpheme that when we add to a verb, when we add to the end of a verb, it tells us that it happened in the past. So the grammatical information is past. Okay, here's another example. Is this Bill's textbook? Here, the S on Bill's is a possessive marker. It gives us information about Bill that the textbook belongs to him. That's the grammatical information this inflectional affix gives us. Okay, here's another one. There are three dogs over there. Here we have another S, but in this case, this S gives us the information that there's more than one dog, or that dog is plural here. Notice that the S in bills and the S in dogs look exactly the same. So inflectional morphemes might look the same, but they carry different bits of grammatical information. Here are some examples of some derivational affixes. Okay, derivational affixes are used to make new words. And sometimes derivation changes the part of speech of a word. For example, it's really expensive to get an education. The first word um, the original word, the root of education, is educate, which is a verb. When we add shun, it changes it from a verb to a noun. Here we have Sarah is unhappy with her job. Happy, an adjective. We've added un to make a new word, meaning the opposite of happy, and it still stays an adjective. And then we have oh my goodness. When we add ness to good, it becomes a noun. Okay, here's a sentence, and I'd like you to try to locate the inflectional and derivational affixes in the following sentence. The man's son decided that he was leaving home because he had wasted all his time shoveling sidewalks, and now he wants to live in a warmer climate. When we look at this sentence, there are several things that are going on in this sentence. In fact, we have many affixes that are here in this sentence. We have first the S after man's, which is the possessive marker. We also have the ING after leaving that indicates that it's an ongoing, um, it's an ongoing situation. Okay? Another example is to look at the ER after warmer, okay? um, which tells us that it's a comparative. So warmer tells us that it is more than just warm, an adjective. Warmer means that it's um, more warm than some other place. Okay? Those are not all of the affixes that are represented here, just a selection. Let's take a look at some words. Okay? Words are usually classified into parts of speech or categories. Grammarians use these categories for English. We have noun, verb, adjective, adverb, pronoun, preposition, and conjunction, and article. So we've gone now from um, roots and affixes when we looked at derivational and inflectional morphemes to words and now we're going to go to the larger level of phrases. A phrase is a group of words that is collected in a meaningful way. We already saw some phrases in our example sentence where we group things into constituents. Each phrase has one word that serves as the main word of the phrase. This word is called the head. Each type of phrase is named after its head. Um, I'll give you an example in just a minute. Okay? Let's take a look at these, um, at these phrases. So this is the sentence we've already seen. The, the excited child chased the puppy around the garden. Let's look at the phrases in this sentence. So we saw, 
sorry, we saw um, that we could divide it in this way. Let's take a look at these phrases in more depth. If I look at the excited child, what, what word is the main word of this phrase? Okay, in this case, the main word is child. And we've added the extra information to describe the child, excited. Okay, so child is the main word. And so that makes the name of the phrase take after that part of speech. So this would be an example of a noun phrase. When we look at chase the new puppy around the garden, this is an example of a verb phrase. Okay, we represent that with a VP. Okay, because chased is the main word in this in this phrase. We also then have the verb chased and the new puppy, okay, where the head is puppy, again a noun, and then we have around the garden, okay. The most important word here, or the head of this phrase, seems to be around. So this is what we call a prepositional phrase. Phrases are joined together to make clauses and sentences. A clause is a noun phrase plus a verb phrase inside of a sentence. Okay, there are two different types of clauses. We have independent clauses and dependent clauses. Okay, let's look at two clauses in this sentence. Although they live far apart, they are still very good friends. First of all, in order for something to be a clause, it must have both a noun phrase and a verb phrase. Okay, so we have to look for something that has both a noun and a verb, and then a second part that has a noun and a verb. So one clause here is, although they live far apart. The second clause here is, they are still very good friends. Although they live far apart, can't stand alone as a sentence by itself. It is possible that we could say, they are still very good friends, and we could leave that there as just one sentence. So it is the independent clause, but although they live far apart, must be joined with something else. And so it is considered, an, it is considered a dependent clause because it depends on another clause in the sentence in order for it to be a full sentence. Okay. Here's some information about rules that happen inside of our head. The knowledge that speakers have about joining phrases and sentences can be represented with rules that express the following. So these are the rules that we know when we know a language. Linear order in which elements must occur within their constituents. So for example, my mental grammar tells me that star green is incorrect or ungrammatical. It tells me that first I must have the adjective and then the noun. Okay? English is adjective and then noun. Green star. Spanish, however, is, is noun and then adjective. The second thing it tells us is it tells us which elements are allowed to occupy the same constituent area. So I can't put chase the into one phrase grouping. It, though, it seems like those are unrelated and must be in two different phrase groupings. And it also tells us the relationship between the elements within and across constituents. Okay? So I wouldn't say something like greens stars, okay? which is common in many languages. Um, and I wouldn't say something like, she hurt himself, because that doesn't seem consistent across the constituents. The summary for this lesson is, first of all, that language is very structured. Okay? This structure is considered to be a hierarchy. And in the study of morphosyntax, we can identify this structure on both the word level with roots and affixes, and the sentence level when we have phrases that join together to make clauses and then sentences. In this course, we will be working from the bottom up. So we will first be starting at the word level to describe the grammar of English. Okay? If you are interested in this language structure, which of course I find fascinating, then you should take more linguistics classes.